chapter 3. And I'm sure that for many here this morning, this will be a very familiar passage. John's Gospel and in chapter 3. Let us hear God's word. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God and that no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? <coughs> Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because the, their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Well, we're grateful for God's holy word and how kind he is to give that word to us. And we pray that that word could come to us in power yes, as um, we look at it. It's a great sure. joy to me to be here with you today. And I do thank you for the very kind invitation. And I trust that we'll know something of God's blessing upon us as we look together into his holy word. And um, I thought that we might turn to this passage in John and chapter 3. It's going to be very familiar indeed to some of you. And it tells us of a man who came to Jesus, this man Nicodemus. John in his gospel seems to have a, a particular concern with um, telling us about people who had some kind of a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ some people who met up with Jesus in one way or another. John is one of Jesus' 12 disciples, and he too had met with Jesus and how precious that was to him. And although John doesn't use the word gospel, he wants us to know and to understand that people came to hear the gospel from Jesus. These things are written, he'll say, near the end of his book, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
Well, John is going to tell us about a number of people. In John in chapter 1, he tells us about some of the disciples who came to know Jesus. In John in chapter 2, he tells us of the first miracle, the turning of water into wine. But he'll tell us there of people who supposedly came to be disciples. But Jesus didn't commit himself to them because he knew all men. But in John in chapter 3, he tells us of this man of whom we've read. His name was Nicodemus. And it's a very well-known story indeed to many in this room this morning. And so we're going to look at that story. We're going to do it under three headings. We're going to begin by talking about the coming The coming, so commendable. So this man comes to Jesus, and we'll notice that he comes to Jesus by night. The coming, this man came to Jesus. That's a good thing to do. The coming, so commendable. Well done. But the challenge, because Jesus is going to speak to this man, and you may be a bit taken aback by the way that Jesus speaks to him. It's kind of blunt. It's kind of from the shoulder, we might say. He doesn't waste too much time. It's kind of blunt. And so we'll speak about the challenge so confrontational. And it is really quite confrontational. He'll say to him, you must be born again. It's pretty confrontational. And then we'll speak of the conversion so critical because that's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about what it means to be converted, to be born again. And he's going to say that conversion to be born again is something so critical. You must, he'll say, be born again. So it's those three headings that we're going to follow there this morning. Let's begin by talking about the coming so commendable. John in chapter 3 tells us about this man, Nicodemus. Let's think about his coming. He came to Jesus by night. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. And so here's a man, he comes to Jesus, but he comes by night. And that often has been thought of in a sort of a negative way, that the man was afraid, that the man was holding back from being identified with Jesus and so on. He came by night. Well, in part, that's true that he was afraid because there was an opinion against this uh, man, Jesus Christ. And I suppose, in a way, being one of the Pharisees, he was a bit cautious what others might think of him coming. But let's commend him this morning, because he did indeed come. He comes with questions. He comes with puzzlement. But he comes. And this man is searching after the truth. I trust that you Uh, are someone searching after the truth. We need to know the truth, don't we? The truth doesn't seem to count for too much in this world in which we live in our day and age, but the truth should count. It should be all so important to us, shouldn't it? This man comes and he's searching out the truth. He's been thinking and he wants to know what's going on. He's heard about Jesus He's particularly heard about the miracles that Jesus did. Now, I guess that all of us in this room this morning will know that Jesus did many miracles. And John actually will focus in his gospel on some of those miracles. He tells us about the first one in the previous chapter, the turning of water into wine at a wedding. A remarkable and amazing miracle. He tells us about that. But he'll tell us about many miracles that Jesus did. And this man, Nicodemus, I don't know whether he'd seen Jesus do miracles. I'm not sure he had. But he certainly heard that Jesus had done miracles. He'll refer to them as signs. This man came to Jesus by night and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God. We know that there's something to you, he's saying. We know that we need to pay attention to you. We know that you're a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus did all sorts of miracles. He turned the water into wine. He would say to the 
to the storm, peace be still, and the wind and the waves obeyed him. But he gave to the blind their sight, he gave to the deaf their hearing, he fed the 5,000. You know about those things. I'm sure each and every one of us know those things. They're miracles. They're things to be wondered at, but they're signs, they're pointers. And so I've come down in the car today with the sat-nav working, which is what I always do. And thankfully the sat-nav kept me right, but um, I was also paying a little bit of attention to the signs. Not too much, if I'm going to be honest. I was listening to the sat-nav and doing what it told me to do. But if you're going on a journey, you're probably going to pay some attention to the signs. They point you in the right direction. The miracles that Jesus did pointed to him as the saviour that God had sent, the one that men and women, boys and girls, needed to listen to. We need to listen to him. They pointed to Jesus. And this man, Nicodemus, seems to have picked that up. He seems to have realised that Jesus did these signs and they said something. They carried a message. They had something to say. This man is thinking about Jesus. God expects us to think, doesn't he? I don't know about your phone, but my phone every morning at about 8.30, it pops up and we're very um, into photographs in our family and it pops up and it, it gives me a series of photographs. I don't know how it does that, but it does. Photographs from the past, they must be in my album somewhere, and it reminds me, well, this happened on such a day five years ago or something and out pop these photographs. And it's lovely. God hasn't sent us photographs as such, but he's given us words and word pictures in the Bible. And he's given us those things so that we can think very carefully. Think about him. Think about our need. Think about who we are, but think about our need to be in touch with him. It's important that we think. And this man, Nicodemus, had certainly been thinking. Nicodemus, um, he had signs you might say, to, to see, but I don't think he actually saw the miracles, but he certainly heard of the miracles. And he's been thinking. Notice his background. He was a ruler of the Jews. So this man was important. This man was an important man, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. He's afraid. He's scared of his fellow Jewish rulers. There's a reason for that. They turned their backs on Jesus. They decided that Jesus, no, they didn't want anything to do with him. But this man is beginning to realize that actually Jesus brought the truth and he needed to listen to him. He needed to know what this was all about. He came to Jesus, he said, Rabbi, that's sort of a, a phrase that honours Jesus. Teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God. We know that there's something about you that we need to think about. There's something here that we need to ponder. Sad to say, the Pharisees, the Jewish rulers in Jesus' day, they'd ruled Jesus out. They decided that Jesus wasn't worth paying any attention to. He contradicted the teaching that they were bringing. They were teaching people that they needed to keep the law. They needed to make their own way to heaven. And the Pharisees, of course, thought of themselves as, uh, you know, some way super duper godly. They thought they were really godly people. They were unable to think. They were unwilling to think that they could be wrong. Jesus was saying things that didn't agree with what they were saying. They ruled him out, but not this man. This man is thinking about Jesus. This man is searching. He's coming with a concern and he's thinking out loud. And I want to encourage you this morning that if you're thinking about the Lord Jesus, you do just that. Be careful to think about Jesus. Be careful to ponder Jesus. Who is he? What's he about? Why did God send him? And how do I need to relate to him? These are oh so important truths, aren't they? There are so many things that can be important to us in life. And um, we, 
we, we, we give them sort of a, a place of importance and they begin to matter to us. But what really matters in life? It's to know God. It's to know our creator. It's to be in touch with him. It's to know the savior that he sent. This man is willing to think. Be careful, my friend, to think. The coming, so commendable. There's something very commendable about this man coming. But the challenge, so confrontational. And we need to think about how uh, Jesus is so direct. He's not sort of, uh, in a sense, particularly gentle on this occasion. Other times he was very gentle. But on this occasion, he's pretty direct. He's pretty straightforward. Now, it's a remarkable thing that God speaks to us at all, isn't it? Given that God made the world and all that therein is, given that God made the world perfect and everything was just as it should be, the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve were in that very blessed position of having fellowship with God, and God spoke to them. He gave them the rule of the garden. He said, you can eat of all the fruits of the garden, all the trees, but there's one tree that you must not eat from. And be clear about this, the day that you eat from that tree, you will most definitely die. The original language, the Hebrews there says, dying, you will die. (coughs) And so God is saying, be clear about this. If you break the rule, if you eat the fruit, the forbidden fruit, we all know that story, you will most definitely die. God spoke. It's amazing that God spoke even after Adam and Eve had gone against God's law and eaten the forbidden fruit. And do you know what? God came and spoke to them. He called out to Adam, Adam, where are you? And he's seeking to bring Adam to a sense of his wrong and of his guilt. And God continues to speak, and he speaks to us in his word, the Bible. And it's amazing that God speaks. And the Bible is such a wonderful book. And God speaks too, in a sense, through his providence. And so, you know, difficult things happen in life. And those things speak to us. They're there to alarm us. They're there to shake us. They're there to wake us up, aren't they? To make us realize that we need to interrelate with God. We need to think about God. It's amazing that God speaks Well, notice the Lord Jesus speaks here. But actually, it's pretty confrontational. We read verse 3. Jesus simply says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is puzzled. He says, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Jesus speaks of this phrase, to be born again. He speaks of being born anew. And he speaks very directly to this man. In fact, Jesus won't hold back. He's going to speak quite boldly to the man. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, he'll say. And when when Nicodemus then um, replies and says, how can these things be? He's puzzling. Jesus will answer and say to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? It's quite strong the way that Jesus speaks to him. It always amazes me whenever I read this passage. Jesus is pretty well in there. He's quite strong. He's direct and he's to the point. Now, we'll come to the substance of what Jesus is saying in a moment. But notice, please, that Jesus is very direct. He's very direct. You'd have a job to describe this as softly, softly. Now, um, you don't know me too well, but I'd be the first person to advocate that in dealing with people, we need to be gracious, and we do, don't we? We need to be warm, we need to be winsome, we need to be loving, and we need to be kind. We certainly do. But notice, please, that the Lord Jesus is very direct here. He's got something to say. I think there's a challenge for us as Christians there this morning with the people that we interrelate with. Are we willing to speak up? 
Are we willing to start a conversation? Are we willing to say something? The time of the lockdown was quite difficult, wasn't it? But you're allowed your walk, and I was very careful during that time of the lockdown. I, I thought to myself, I'm, if I'm going to keep my sanity, I need to get out and get this walk every day. And so I was out every day getting my, my walk and so on. And I was careful to do that. But it was a wonderful opportunity to sort of meet people without getting too close to them, of course, but to meet people and to have a conversation with them. And we need to have conversations with people, don't we? Jesus has a conversation. It's a pretty direct conversation. It's pretty straight. He's pretty straight dealing, isn't he? He says to this man, you need to be born again. He's not dancing around the truth. He's pretty direct. A couple of years ago, there appeared a, a news item on TV. I remember it well. And it was something quite crazy, really. It was the run-up to Christmas. And it was about some dancing binmen in Birmingham. A bit cranky, really. A bit odd and strange and all the rest of it. They were dancing. And apparently the thought behind this was that they were dancing because um, Christmas, they said, is about making people happy. Well, I would argue with that. And I would say, actually, ultimately, Christmas is about making people holy. God sent his son into the world that we should be changed. And we've changed the meaning of Christmas altogether, haven't we? And we've thrown the sort of whole message of Jesus coming out with the, you know, the bathwater. We've, we've, we've thrown it out in many, many ways in our culture. But actually, Jesus' coming was that we might be made holy. And if we're to be made holy, there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, and it's our sin. And Jesus here, in a sense, he's quite confrontational. He says to this man, you need something in your life. You need desperately something to happen in your life. You need to be born again. I don't know if you've been born again. But you need to be born again. The coming, so commendable. The challenge, so confrontational. But the conversion, let's get to the, the guts of what it is that Jesus is talking about here. The conversion, so critical. What is the message? What is Jesus saying in this passage? What is he saying to Nicodemus? He's saying that Nicodemus needed the new birth. He needed to be born again. He needed God to do something in his heart. He needed to be born of water, but he needed to be born of the Spirit. Now, to be born again, and we've all probably heard that phrase at some point or other, the word there that's being used um, can often be translated in the New Testament to be born from above. And yes, we're very familiar with the phrase born again, but I could easily argue that actually the phrase really should be translated to be born from above. And so, yes, we do need to be born again, and I'm thoroughly uh, committed to that truth. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here this morning. But actually the phrase often is translated born from above. You've got it in verse 31 of John and chapter 3. Maybe you want to look down and see that. He who comes from above... And that's the same word that we've got here, you see. To be born again is to be born from on high. It's to have God intervene in your heart. It's for the Spirit of God to come and to do something in your heart and to change you, to make you anew, to be born, yes, again, to be born from above. You've got the same word, it's used in John's Gospel in chapter 19 and down at verse 11. You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given you from above. To be born again is to be born from above. It's for God to reach down and to do something in a person's life. Sometimes we use the word regeneration. 
And the clue is in the re, isn't it? Hmm? Regeneration. We're born the first time, but regeneration. To be born again, to be born anew, to be born afresh. And that's something that God does. Something that God does by his spirit. Look at verse 5. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us needs a new birth. Each and every one of us needs new life in Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus says in verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, um, we've talked with the children there this morning about being born, and isn't it a wonderful thing when children are born into the world and how wonderfully grateful we are for that. I've gotten uh, seven grandchildren and uh, take great delight in, in them and in looking after them. And it's wonderful that we can have children and grandchildren. What a wonderful blessing that is. But there's always that recognition that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Our children are born to us and they're like us. <coughs> we were born of our parents, sinners, and our children are born of us, sinners. What we need is a work of God the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, says Jesus, is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And there's this vital need, dear friend, to be born again again to be born of God and the reason for that is quite simple because ever since the garden of Eden man has been in a state of spiritual death now you say well man isn't dead he's alive and kicking and he's running about and you're not saying to me this morning that I'm dead well I am saying that man is born yes alive and kicking but in a state of spiritual death death, alienated from God, opposed to God, not wanting God, not wanting God's ways, not even really wanting God's help. Oh, I know that people, when they're in a time of trouble, yes, they'll turn to God then, but most of the time they don't really want God. They ignore God. They spurn God. The Pharisees, this group that Nicodemus came from, emphasized their external law keeping. But the problem was the heart. The Pharisees were religious. Oh, they were religious, all right. But the problem was in their heart. And we each of us have a heart problem. And so I hope this morning that your heart is good <laughs> and that you're out getting a bit of exercise. I'm doing my walking, I'm out doing my swimming. Now I've retired. It's great. I'm in the swimming pool three or four times a week. That's great. And trying to look after the heart and all the rest of it. But I'm not talking about the physical heart. I'm talking about your person, your inner being. We all of us need a new heart to be born again, to be recreated, to be born from above. We each of us need the intervention of God, the Holy Spirit. We need God. Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Like, says the commentator, does and only can beget like. And we may want to think, well, I'm not just a chip off the old block. I'm better than that. And I've learned and I've seen my mother's and father's mistakes and I'm better than that. But actually, like does and only can beget like. Another way of expressing that is that cats produce cats. Horses, horses. And sinners, sinners. And we're all of us in that category. And how then does being born again come about? How does it happen? Notice that Jesus is not telling Nicodemus about something that he could do. This was from above. 
This was from above. You need to be born from above, he says. The Jews had their spiritual washings and so on. And it may well be that that's what Jesus is alluding to when he speaks of being born of water and of the Spirit. It may well be that that's what he's alluding to there. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he's talking beyond the, the idea of water, the, the, the sort of physicality of washing. He may be referring there to baptism. It's unclear, I think. But what is very clear is that we need to be born from above. Jesus is not telling Nicodemus something that he could do, but something that needed to happen in his life. I wonder, dear friend, have you been born again? Has God moved in your heart? God broken into your soul? This kind of time of year is kind of special to me because when I was 18 years of age, I went off to university. I was raised, <coughs> raised in a family. Sorry, I was raised in a family. Where <coughs> raised, <coughs> whoops. <coughs> raised <coughs> in a family where my mum and dad <coughs> were very kind people, very loving people indeed. Um, and I was sent to church. Three times on a Sunday I was at church. But they never went themselves. <laughs> you know, I was in the choir. I was there in the morning. I was at Sunday school in the afternoon. I was at church in the evening in the choir. Three times a day. That went, went on for years. But my mother and father were never there. <clears throat> Reason to think my grandfather was a Christian. But my mother and father never there. And so I went off to university. And the thought in my mind was I was a Christian. That's what I thought, I was a Christian. One day I was sitting at a meal table and opposite me was a fellow that I got talking to and he said something about being a Christian. And I said, oh, I said, I'm a Christian too. And with that, his, his ears almost popped up and he said, oh, he said, you must come along to the Bible study with me on a Tuesday night, at which point I can assure you that I was realizing that I'd made a major mistake and that um, I'd boo-booed here and this was not a good idea. Well, I managed to escape that day. I managed to evade his clutches. But I was coming back the following Saturday night from the pub. That's where I'd been, I'd been to the pub coming back from the pub and I walked into the hall where I was staying and out of the television room, this fellow, I think he'd been watching Match of the Day, out of the television room he came and I crazily said, oh, you must come and have coffee with me. So he came and we had coffee. And that began a friendship. And the friendship sort of moved on because he began to introduce questions to me. What is the purpose of life? What does life mean? What is sin? What about eternity? We've been decorating at home and um, I was going to actually bring the little piece of paper that I've still got with these questions written down on it, but we've been decorating and so everything is everywhere at the moment. So I've not got the little piece of paper with me there today, but it's there at home, these questions. And for weeks then, I wrestled with these questions and wanting to think, dear friend, that I was a good person, wanting to believe that I was, yes, a Christian in the sense of being an upright person. And it went on. He came one day, he said, the Christian Union is going to have a mission. Will you come? <laughs> and so I realized I was getting deep into this now. And I said, well, I'll come to one meeting. It was on the 14th of November, 1974, it was at lunchtime. It was a fellow called Graham Cray who went on to be an Anglican bishop. He's retired now. And he spoke at that meeting. And I went to the meeting with no sense, no desire whatsoever to have any thought of becoming a Christian, as he said. But by the end of the meeting, I knew I needed to be a Christian. God had been speaking, you see, 
and I'd become uncomfortable about my life and about my sinful ways. And by the end, I knew that I needed to become a Christian. God had reached down. God had done something for me. Dear friend, that's what you and I need. We need to be born again. It's not something that we do. But we need to be born again. You need to be born again. And you and I need to be bold to speak. Let's learn that this morning from Jesus. Not in... Um, uh, you know, an uh, uncomfortable way, perhaps, not in a sharp way, though perhaps at times we need to be sharper than we are, but certainly in a forthright way. Jesus spoke to this man. You need to be born again. Let me tell you the end of the story, of course. Nicodemus, I believe, was converted by the end of John's Gospel because we find him coming and wanting to look after the body of Jesus. And he's out of kilter. He's out of step with his Jewish friends now. And it seems that he's come to be <coughs> born again. But the message this morning, you need to be born again. We're going to...